Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Columbus This Week with Trevor and Eric, bringing you all the greatest news, events, stories, um, and whatever's going on in Columbus this week. It's a pretty apropos title, you know, Columbus This Week. It's what's happening in Columbus this week. Sometimes some of these stories are from the future, though. Or are two weeks in, in a row. <laughs> it's, it's Columbus We're, last week. Columbus last week and the week before. Yeah, so um, it feels good to be back, Trevor. Um, I, I would say glad to have you back, but... <laughs> yeah just, okay. just kidding eric yeah so um yeah i had a had a great vacation although i'd rather be back where i was with a million billion dollars because that'd be awesome because i wouldn't have to work but work's not bad i guess but vacation is better so what did you end up doing on your vacation uh so i went skiing in the great state of colorado uh bought a bucket of donuts for eight dollars got threatened by homeless people that they were going to blow us away and uh, had a fantastic ski trip and only, only almost died one time. Was it with the homeless man who was going to blow you away? No, but it was when I was skiing. And then um, <laughs> we went we went to the top of... Uh, at, so we went to Breckenridge and then uh, there's one peak called Peak 6. And we were like... It was snowing that day. So it was like, you know, the weather was great and it was like perfect for... You know, it was perfect for skiing. But when we got to the top of like the, con- the, top of the peak, the conditions kind of got bad. And everything like everything was fine going down, no issues or whatever. And then as I was going down, I like my ski dug into the snow, like up into my boot. So there's like powder skiing and like you're just skiing and like you can't even see your skis because they're in the snow. But this is like different than that. So I was going and then my ski got lodged into something. I don't know what it was. And it launched me forward like five feet or something like that. I had to crawl back to my ski, but I like smashed my head. I was wearing a helmet because I'm not an idiot. Uh, so I smashed my head like right onto like, either a rock or just like a really hard snowbank, and then I was pretty dizzy after that. So I just called it the quits after that. But there's only like two hours left in the ski day anyway. We had started at like eight thirty, but besides that, it was pretty awesome. So the ski day, man, yeah. I actually have so many things to say. First of all, well, hold on, hold on. The the resort, like the well, not resort, but like the the slopes, they're only open from like eight thirty to four because they don't like you. You can't ski at night there because it's just too crazy. You'll die. Yeah, basically. What happens if people do? Well, you'll get caught, probably. But even if you didn't get caught, it's really stupid. They have, like, people patrolling at night? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Anyways, why do they call it Peak 6? Is there, like, Peaks 1 through 5? Actually, no. There's Peaks 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. But there's no 1 through 5? Yeah. Who came up with this system? I don't know. It wasn't me. Jesus. It was pretty great. Like, we went to the top of all the peaks and got some, you know, it's an amazing view and stuff. But, yeah, it was a lot of fun, so... But here I am. So let's go back to the homeless man real quick, though. Um, yeah. So you got a homeless man threatened to blow you away. Yeah. What is it with you and the homeless? I don't know, man. I was, I did, like, I don't know. You know, like, you know how many... just pulled up in a minivan, five dudes got out, and then a homeless guy just starts walking across the street as soon as he sees us pull up. And he's just, like, starts asking for money. And then he's just like, oh, I'm going to blow all you guys away and all this stuff. And then, like, when we came back out, <laughs> oh, I will say this. So we got, like, donuts and stuff. When we came back out, he like tried to get like not he didn't try to get in but he was like right next to the door. Um, I was like telling this guy like slam the door shut like so we can go because like I don't want to deal with this homeless guy. And then the homeless guy was like, um, he was just standing there. And then one of the guys in the car was like, "Well, you want a donut?" And the guy's like, "I don't want no effing donut." Blah blah blah. I'm like, "Well, get out of here then." So, you, <sighs> why? Okay, you know what? You have a. You have way too many homeless stories for, like, a normal person. Dude, I don't know. I guess I go to hipster places where the homeless people still are. No, you remember you were on a road trip once, and you had to deal with, like, a homeless person trying to attack you, and then you taught... We did that story about the short north and the homeless yeah. people. Like, I don't know, man. I just have a... I, I, th- I think... I would have thought with, like, the beard and, like, my very, like... I walk around, I'm like, I don't make eye contact with homeless people. I ignore them, and, like, I don't look at them, and then I try to, like, look mean and, like, don't bother me. They just still bother me. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why. Understand. Why do homeless people fuck with you? I never have this problem. I don't know, man. Whatever. All right. But anyway, um, I wasn't like worried or anything. It's just annoying. But like, why? I just don't understand. Like, if you're a homeless guy or person, guy or girl, like, why would you approach a group of five guys? Well, maybe like he's... even if he did have a gun or something, like we were all like in arms reach. So somebody like maybe he would have shot one person, but he would have got thrown down. So what? I just don't understand. Well, he's crazy though. So I guess there's no logic to be had. But I also just don't understand being homeless in Colorado. Like, I feel like you just freeze to death. You should just leave and go to yeah. go to California. Yeah. He was in Denver. So it's like... Oh, although, I will say, it wasn't that cold. But it was like... Uh, when we left and came back to Columbus, it was like 60 degrees. 
Really? Yeah. How are it you, was like t-shirt weather. How are you able to snow, or how are you able to ski then? Well, when you go up in the mountains, it's a lot colder. I see. But even there, it's not like it was like forty degrees or something. But like as you go up higher, like on the peaks, like up to the peaks and stuff, it's just colder and windier. So, but it like the sun's out. Like you'll get if you're like if you were skiing without like in, let's say like if you were skiing in like a t-shirt or something, you'd get sunburnt for sure. Huh. But. It was a lot of fun, so I'd like to be back there, but I did miss Columbus this week, so... Oh, not Columbus, just the podcast. Yeah. All right. No, well, I, did miss, I did miss Columbus, but... Well, do we have any events? Nope. <laughs> no <laughs> events. Nothing's happening in Columbus this nope. week. Nope. Tune in um, next time. Yeah. Uh, we do have some good construction... Uh, I got some construction news, so... This story, I think, came out while I was in Colorado, but I don't think you and Sam touched on it, but... Uh, in Franklinton, Columbus is considering doing an urban highline park, like park trail, as part of this like new Franklinton, uh, like Franklinton Park or whatever. So uh, it's supposed to be a thousand feet long between the intersection of Lucas and Chapel Streets and the Scioto River, and would run along an abandoned railroad, whatever, and uh, on bridges over the west town of West Rich Street um, near the. <laughs> I like how they call it this, but it's the 400 West Rich Artist Colony. So what is so, it replacing? It wouldn't. It would just, like, there's train tracks that aren't used. Oh, I so see. So there's, like, some bridges and stuff, and it's just, like, an elevated uh, park. Trail. Okay. So that so it's just taking the the place of the abandoned train tracks, then? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, that's so, cool. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, I mean, frankly, anything that allows more people to walk and bike is, I think, a good thing. So, um, so that's going on. There is a... Uh, oh, so in the short north, the short north, people have been complaining about, like, all the traffic and everything. As they should. Yeah. Uh, as they shouldn't, but um, you know that's what you get. Like if you want to work and live there and drive a car, so you get stuck in traffic. Well, but, the annoying thing is, like High Street is like a main street, but you can't. Like you have to go around High Street if you're in that area. Yeah, although I don't know, it's not. I don't think it's that bad, but like it's not like it's New York or something. I, I mean, mean, yeah. Uh, during during certain times of the day, like people will just be crossing through half of our green light. So it's not like easy. Like it's literally easier to navigate around it, go to any and all or something. Yeah, but I say just walk or ride your bike, and then you won't have that problem. We well, don't have to. But all. So here's the thing. But during your during your drive, like your your drive because you're driving, it's like really disgusting because you're like looking at all the construction. You're you're just sitting there and you're like, ah, oh, I hate looking at these concrete barriers and these orange cones. Well, I've got news for you. The uh, the city is going to let people, or maybe it's the Short North Commission, I don't know, but they're going to let people like paint the construction barriers, so get out and have fun and, and paint them, so they won't look as, they might actually look worse, because <laughs> I don't know what people's like painting skills are like, but uh, hopefully they won't. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, it, um, it reminds me of the graffiti wall down in Athens. Yeah, um, and then the other other thing that's going on is uh, Coco is going to be expanding into Upper Arlington, Bexley, and Grandview. Which what is, is? Cool. Coco? What in the world? Oh, the the bike thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's like one in German Village, and one in the Brewery District, and those bikes are overpriced. I don't. I've never ridden one, so I, don't, I have my own bike. So, yeah. which they're I've also a, never ridden. They're not as bad now. as DC though. In DC, I swear to God, it's DC is expensive bikes. Almost as bad to like, or it's almost it's almost as easy to rent a car as to like rent one of those stupid bikes. Yeah. They charge you like three dollars an hour or something. No, I think it's even more than that. I when, think when I was there last, it was it was a boatload of money. Yeah, it I was think. like eighteen dollars for like a hour trippers i don't know something like that hmm. maybe 12 but that's all i got for uh construction roundup slash events all right so let's move on to the two minute tape so first up eric um we have a story coming out of wooster college what college wooster what wooster yeah i've never heard of it sorry i mean are you fr- have you ever been to like northeastern columbus northeastern columbus or sorry ohio like cleveland yes like cleveland. Well, i mean i've been there i Oh, but, you don't know the colleges in the area? How dare you? So anyway, well, there's Akron and there's Cleveland State, and then um, uh, what's it called? I know uh, I can't believe I can't remember the Case Western. Case Western, yeah, yeah, yeah. How I know those, but so, anyways, to to make a long <laughs> story story, um, so s- some students took over a campus building on Wooster College. Um, they issued a list of twenty three demands, including the expulsion of a right wing student. So essentially, what happened is, <laughs> okay, they had like a college Republicans or whatever group. Yeah, it seems like as these, every college does. It seems like this these dumb stories always start with like there was a college Republicans group. Yeah. So anyways, um I guess some kid or I, I guess college student posted like some racist meme. And I'm I'm just taking the story at like at college face value. Yeah, yeah, college fixes face value. Um 
And so students responded to this this one person's action by like demanding that he be expelled and issuing twenty three demands because they felt unsafe. Okay. Well, you can't expel people for like. I don't know. Maybe they can start. Maybe they'll well, start. That's, that's where you're people. wrong, Eric. You can yeah. do what you want. Did he actually get expelled? I don't think so. That's like weird. I think they just left at like when the building closed. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> they just left. I mean, they're not very good protesters, but yeah. They, they made the news, I guess, so they've got that going for I them. I guess it's Ohio and news, at least. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, they're not national news. They're not burning shit down like Berkeley. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Next up, you wanted to talk about a article called Quitting Twitter. Well, I didn't really want to talk about it. I just wanted to make fun of it. Sure. Quitting Twitter by Lindy West. Okay. Let's so, give, give us the highlights. Um, so some lady. So, so I have a subscription to the New York Times. Um, How so, dare you? Some some he, it's everyone and I I don't even like it I hate it but he, I'm too lazy to cancel it. He won't have that subscription for long once you hear about our next story. No, I'm still gonna have it. I'm just gonna make fun of this lady though. Unless they make they'll force me to cancel it. I don't think they would, but it'd be cool if they did. So um, there's this lady. She wrote an article called "Quitting Quitting Twitter," and basically, what, what did you describe these people as? Internet people or something? Very internet persons. Yeah, very. So their whole life revolves around their social media presence, and this is one of those people. Yeah, she's a very internet person. And before she edited the article, or the New York Times edited the article, um, one of the things she said that was just so like I can't believe this, but very, very much describes a very internet person was. Here's the quote. Well, here's what my life is like. Now that she's quit Twitter, um, I don't wake up with a pit in my stomach every day, dreading what horrors accrued on my in my phone overnight. So you got to think about the mentality of somebody like this. Like they wake up and like they pick up their phone. That's like, you know, I mean, I so I pick up my phone and like read the news to like wake up because um, it's hard to wake up when you wake up at six a.m. every day. But she like, you know, she like picks up this phone, looks at it, and then she's just like, oh my god, like all these people said all these things on Twitter beyond stupid let me uh, uh wait can i can i just follow yeah, up go but, ahead so so george Clark, wow george carlin had a uh, had a quote about this when he was talking about like his seven dirty words bit because yeah. he got sued and so he's so some reverend like was talking about his son hearing the the like bit on the radio yeah he's like well you know reverend the radio has two knobs yeah one uh one turns it off and the other changes the station yeah this is so stupid which is yeah which i'm gonna get into but uh another one of the other quotes was uh I don't get dragged into protracted bad faith arguments with teenage boys about whether people deserve medical medical care or whether putting nice guys in the friend zone is a hate crime. Very uh, shrill, to say the least. And then she said, I shouldn't have had to walk away from all of that because for Twitter to take a firm stance against neo-Nazism might have cost it some incalculable sliver of profit. So, I mean, there are definitely like some bad faith people on Twitter, but hey, lady, guess what? Like if you stop following a bunch of idiots, like it's like garbage in, garbage out. Like if you if you're following a bunch of garbage people who are making garbage statements and like you want to be part of the garbage like discussion, like you're gonna catch garbage. That that's how it works. Like I have a Twitter account, and you know as you you guys can follow me now. Um, actually, probably can't. I don't even know how it works because I just I immediately went in and made everything like protected and private because I wanna I wanted to like check it out as a news source and like I actually think it's pretty good. So I'm getting news from like the brewery district and um, he's saying follow him, but you'll never be able to see his tweets. Yeah, well, I think if um, I don't, even, I honestly don't know. I have no idea how it works. I just, I just went in and put like max privacy everything. So, but um, it's like I actually, I mean, I don't mind. Like, I look at Twitter once in a while, and then it's like, you know, the o- OSU's or the O dots, like, hey, we're closing seventy. Which, by the way, they closed seventy this weekend. Um, but it's like, oh, we're closing seventy this weekend. I'm like, oh, okay, like that's a great thing for me to know. Like now I know that. Now, like when I'm coming, I usually would take seventy to get up here, but you yeah. know now I don't because I'm not like now I know this close. So I just went an alternate route. But if you're like following people who are making comments about like Donald Trump and like, you know, I don't know, like whatever, like whether people deserve medical care, like that's your fault and that's your problem. Like I mean, I guess it's good that she quit it. Like quit this like abuse abusive relationship she had with well, social media so to it. be fair it might not necessarily what's what's more likely happening is she would like write an article and then post about it on twitter and then people like reply to her right yeah like what's she expecting like, everybody to just get on there and agree with her and then i mean yeah if she so if you write an article that's like here is why universal health care is good if you're if you're on social media you should just expect people to be like Here's why. Yeah, here's why. Yeah, here's why I disagree. Yeah, so like, um, I'm for universal health care, but I can also see arguments like against it. So, um, but she, you know, obviously she calls. She's just like, oh, all these people are teenage teenage boys. Although there are definitely women who also don't think 
who also uh, don't think poor people deserve medical care. So I don't know why she's singling out boys or, you know, men or whatever. But, you know, she's like, oh, like getting into arguments with teenage boys about whether poor people deserve medical care. Well, hey, lady, guess what? There's like more than one argument to be had for something like universal health care. So just because somebody disagrees with you doesn't mean that, you know, if you insult them, like you're just a big idiot and you're just part of the problem, too. So, whoo. Okay. Didn't you want to call her out for something, too? What, being dumb? No, uh, she edited her article. Oh, I, no, because I don't really have a problem with editing it after the fact, especially because we what we did was we just used the archive and just pulled it back up. So yeah, um, but yeah, one of Eric, <laughs> one of Eric's quotes he had to re-retrieve was the it was the first one. It was about um, waking up with a pit in my stomach every day because it's like, like what's wrong with you? Like I mean, she still, so obviously she probably still has like Facebook and Instagram. Like that feeling's not going away just because you axed one like social media account. So, I mean, you're still, like, you're a public, like, you're writing public articles. Like, you're going to get feedback. Deal with it, lady. Yeah. Anyways, I think she needs to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> She's got, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, on the uh, on the topic of NYT, and um, so I think you and I can agree that this lady is clearly a white supremacist writing for a white supremacist <laughs> newspaper. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe that. All right. So, um, this, is a, this is a trending tweet coming from Sarah Kensador. Um the New York Times is now a white supremacist newspaper. The multiple <laughs> Nazi puff pieces, the constant pro-Trump PR. That's and, ridiculous. And the praise for Miller on today <laughs> of all days was not exceptional. It's the guiding ideology of the paper. I, I don't think every writer there shares it, but it dominates the coverage. Oh, hashtag, it's so unbelievable. Hashtag unsubscribe. They're clearly like, anti, like anti-Trump. like anti Oh, yeah, I agree so, with that. That's so – like I don't even – yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I don't even care like if it's pro or anti, but it's like that's – this is beyond stupid. So. so so anyways, hashtag unsubscribe was trending Jeez. because I want to hashtag unsubscribe to this lady. Somebody wrote an article called The Necessity of uh the the necessity of oh. what's his name? Um but anyways, somebody in Trump's uh, administration, because he's like a nationalist guy, and they they wrote this article and it was released on like um, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and so everybody's like unsubscribe from the yeah. New York Times because they're Nazis. <laughs> it's so dumb. Yeah. Also, there was one other story I wanted to mention in the now long two minutes hate. Okay, so you know Law and Order SVU, right? Do what? Have you seen Law and Order SVU, the TV show? No, really, never. Why would I watch that? That I sounds terrible. Really? Yeah. So everyone who is not you has probably seen the show. <laughs> okay. Um, and so apparently they released an episode where like a, a person who is basically supposed to be Ann Coulter gets like raped with like a sign. Wow, that's kind of weird. And then, like, so the, this whole article is like this cringe fest where they just, like, stereotype and, or I mean, they just, yeah, kind of stereotype and cult or stereotype like this anti fa guy, stereotype like this alt right guy. Yeah. And it's just this giant, like, disastrous, poorly written shit show with quotes like, um, the Ann Coulter characters, like, you know, I, I said that victims were never actually sexually assaulted. Now it's happened to me. <laughs> that's so just bad. It's it's see now you know I don't watch shows like that. It's because <sighs> you're garbage. Just about every show that's on mainstream television is just absolutely bad. So, Except like especially if it, anything that's put out by like ABC, CBS, NBC, like any of the like they just put out garbage shows for garbage people. So, but uh, yeah, I thought you might be interested to know that that existed somehow. No, I'm not interested at all. I would <laughs> rather you not told me that. So oh, so does it make you angry? Do you hate it? Yeah. Appropriate segment then. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that does All it for right. the two minutes hate. Ready to move on to Columbus News? Oh, I can't wait. All okay. right, let's do it. So the first story we have is a, a story that came out from, well, it was on WOSU. And uh, it turns out Columbus ranks near bottom for economic well-being of immigrants. And I thought that that was pretty curious. And it turns out, so based on these, there's like, a, there's no, like, it's not like one category, it's a few. So the uh, the fact, the the cr- criteria they used for economic well-being for immigrants were entrepreneurship rate, the, the presence of other immigrants, household incomes compared to native households, and immigrant unemployment rates. So then they go on to say that um, Columbus ranked 46th out of 50 out out of the 46 out of the nation's largest 50 largest metro areas, and then um, the the immigrant unemployment rates around six percent, while the metro area for Columbus is like two is uh, like 3.7. 
And then immigrants households tend to earn 24 to 20, well, basically 25% less than native households. And um, they said that Columbus is a relatively low concentration of immigrants compared to other large cities. I find that a little bizarre. Why? Because Well, first of all, two of the criteria are really bad. So the immigrant entrepreneurship rate is a garbage criteria. Um, and then the presence of other immigrants is not... Um, as a non-fact, it does. It simply doesn't matter. Yeah, I would. So that's I would, that's like a that's a that's a stupid, you know, that's a stupid person, like factor because it tries to imply that, and if an immigrant moves into a community, that unless there are other immigrants there of you know probably of the same race or the same nation or nationality or whatever, that like that's that like means a good thing and i don't really necessarily think that means a good or bad thing and it's probably a bad thing to get ghettos are thing. good yeah i think ghettos are bad so i mean yeah that's 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 kind of the implication yeah. um and they're implying that ghettos are good yeah well that's what i'm saying yeah um but that aside um this isn't surprising and i do think it's probably accurate regardless um well and I, I, unemployment's yeah. a good measure so here's why i think it's accurate we we know that the poorest areas in columbus aren't like I mean, they're like the the Somali areas. They're like the areas right. just south of Morris Road, north like North Linden. Yeah. Um, Hilltop is a is a different case, but anyways. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? Fuck. Um, like the infant mortality. That's that's all like in the. I mean, that's all in the immigrant areas. Like yeah. the the areas of Columbus that have the biggest problems are also the areas that are like majority immigrants. Yeah. Like, that's just a known thing. Yeah. So and, th- this shouldn't really surprise anyone. Yeah. And I, I just think it's kind of a bizarre, like, piece because, so one of the things they, so the the worst, like, Columbus's worst ranking was with, with entrepreneurship. That was, like, the category we did the worst out of all of them. And uh, it was, like, just 5% of immigrants are entrepreneurs, the same rate as Cincinnati, but Cleveland is, like, 6%. Um, and then the cities with the highest immigrant entrepreneurship rates were California, Texas, Florida. But like you got to think about who's coming to those areas. So in Texas, you're getting you you have a large Hispanic, um, a lar- you know large number of Hispanic. Same with Florida too. You have a large number of Hispanic uh, immigrants, and in California, you're got like all kinds of Asian people for sure. Um, you know people from like China or Japan or Korea or, or wherever. And it's like, I mean, there it's it's a lot different when you have somebody who's coming from Somalia, right? I will say one of the other things that probably honestly drives this is that we have a huge, huge, um, how would you, how would you call like, um, like a huge part of our tech community in Columbus is like overseas developers who are, who are now here and working for a company. Right. Well, so that was one of the things I thought was kind of crazy because like, so do they not count like people from India or China who are here working in technology? Well, no, they absolutely do. But the thing is, those people aren't getting counted in entrepreneurship. So that's the, the see, that's the problem because most of those people who, you know, get like their, their masters or their bachelors in computer science here. Yeah. Those people are going to work for companies. Yeah. Like that's a low, the very low well, entrepreneurship group because it, it pays really well to. Yeah. yeah. But that's one of the things that I find kind of bizarre about the study overall. Well, first of all, a, a 1% difference in the rates I mean, who cares, frankly? It's just not a, this isn't, I mean, you know, we're at 4.8% and Cleveland's at like almost 6%. Like, who cares? It's not even a, as far as, you know, percentage wise, it's just not a big deal. That's like a 25% difference in the. Well, yeah, but I mean, who cares? It's still 1%. I mean, it's not that much. What's it amount to? Like another 5,000 people or something? So that's, I don't know. I think that's stupid. But um, the other thing is, is like, I, I, I just find it weird because. Well, first of all, I don't really know who they're counting as immigrants. I, I, I have a feeling that they're not counting. Because, dude, like, there are so many like so many people here in Columbus who are from other countries working in, like, technology. Like, I mean, that's just a fact. Like, and then healthcare as well. So, you know, I, I just don't understand, like, where, like, you know, frankly, where are all the, you know, where's the big problem at? I mean, I, is it just one group of people? Or are they not counting, like, some of the people who have immigrated Maybe they're not counting people who have immigrated here from like other or have come to Ohio from other states well, for jobs, but like they're originally immigrants. Maybe so. I keep in mind, six percent is still a pretty low unemployment number. Like that means yeah. that means that ninety four percent are employed. Yeah. So it, it like regardless, it's a small group. Yeah. So I don't know. I just uh, I mean, it was an interesting thing to see, but I didn't really agree with the. Uh, I, I I mean, unfortunately, so WOSU's they're not very like political largely. I mean, they are a little bit left wing, but that's fine. 
But um, so I, I mean, it wasn't like this big article like Columbus is the worst or anything like that. So, but I think it was worth kind of discussing. So, yeah, I do think that um, if these are if if we're at about the bottom, that that really speaks to how well the country is doing right now. Because honestly, six percent unemployment. Yeah. Like, remember when people were begging for that in like 2009? Yeah, I also recall that like the youth unemployment, I think in Spain is like 40% or 20% or something. Well, yeah. Like that. So I think. Yeah. Um, so we got a pretty well off here. Yeah, Spain's like 33% and France is like 25%. Yeah, that's insane, dude. Okay. So um, so I, th- I, th- I think we could, we could be worse off than six. Yeah. All right. All right. What's so, up next? Um, next story I have is uh, is a pretty cool like homegrown story. So there's a uh, a company in the short north that makes suits, like you know they they sell suits off the rack and then they do custom suit stuff called a uh, per suit, which I like the name. That's kind of cool. But um, they actually got a contract to um, uh, do the suits for the men, U.S. men's curling team for the Winter Olympics in uh, South Korea. Yep. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know some some notoriety there. I mean. I haven't bought a suit from them, so I don't have any, you know. Wait, what do they need suits for, though? It's so in curling, like you wear a suit. What a dumb sport! <laughs> you know what curling is, right? Yeah, I know oh, with yes. the with the brooms. Yeah. Yeah. So the the person who, at least the person who's like shoving the like the thing down, what yeah. I don't know what it's called, um, but shoving like the thing down, like they wear a suit. Well, so. I also know that in that sport, the team captain is like, or sorry, the team is named after the team captain's last name. Like yeah. it seems like a very it's like it's all focused around like one guy. Yeah, it's a very weird sport. I think it's cool though. Whatever, but it's cool that they're um, you know they're getting to do that. So, it's, all right. So, um, it, speaking of the short north, I guess the city uh, has come up with a new policy for incentives for tax abatements. Particularly, you know, I guess this is really applying here to the short north. So the the previous policy was so there's 16 neighborhoods um, that the the city's you know trying to they're offering these incentives for in the the um, the previous incentive was a 15-year, 100% property tax abatement, and uh, the city's looking to pretty much uh, revi- like you know, change that. And then um, anything that is over six stories will still get an incentive, but they're just, they're changing up like the the benefits here. So 10% of the units need to be affordable and rented to households making up to 80% of the average medium income, median income, and then another 10% um, of units would go to households making up to 100% of the uh, average median median income. I keep saying medium, but it's median. What defines affordable? Uh, I have no idea. So the city defines it affordable. That's affordable. I, I so I, I don't I don't have I don't know. Like I'm kind of mixed on this. Like I don't. I mean, I, it's nice that like the the problem is you end up in cases like New York City, like that's or San Francisco, like those are the worst extremes. So well, yeah. So, York, but. um, I guess if you don't know how this tends to go, um, there are a lot of places in New York. You can even check on Zillow. Look for like the cheapest places in like Manhattan. Yeah, and you'll see exactly what's going on. You have places that are like guaranteed by the government to um, to be able to take in low income persons. And so what you do is you prove that you're low income. And then you get to live in these places that are significantly cheaper than like anything else in the area. Yeah, like by far. Like you're but, talking like three or four thousand dollars a month rent for yeah. regular people, and then you're like a thousand or something. Yeah, but there's a serious caveat here, and that's that typically the rent of these places, and in Manhattan, it's it's nowhere near a thousand; it's much higher. But but anyways, yeah. so the the issue is the people that meet the requirements for these places in New York City. Mm-hmm. There's no way they on their income can live there. Like, yeah. it's, it's still just not possible. Um, yeah. And so I think what ends up happening is the only people who can actually live there are people who have a tremendous amount of savings but don't have much income coming in. Yeah. And so it limits that to a very specific market. And it's kind of this weird – it's it's kind of this weird deep discount from the government for this very specific use case where you have a lot of money but you don't have income. Yeah. But um, and another thing that's going to end up happening is uh, you'll end up – like, they'll end up renting out – the apartments for higher prices to make up you know make up the difference. oh yeah every everyone i mean yeah everyone else is going to end up subsidizing you but that's that's sort yeah. of the the nature of the renting and market i think when it comes to housing in columbus i think they should just let people go um i i think at, at this point the short north doesn't need any tax abatements unless unless what they wanted to do was encourage very high density and taller buildings but any like any other any other like tax abatements or stuff? I think it's pretty much over. I don't really think there's a there's a need for that anymore. 
yeah. and other areas like down so like down by nationwide children's i think they're trying to do um some more investment down there or like some more encouragements for like the east side of Par- parsons avenue and like you know livingston parsons right there that's fine because that area still needs more um you know still needs more work but like the short north like they should just get unless they're going to build like 40 story towers or something or 20 story buildings or something like that i think um they don't really need to to do anything else so all right um so i guess i guess the only other thing that that's annoying about this is they're trying to govern as if um they have a problem like san francisco as where they have actual trouble getting um I guess like low, like unskilled job laborers. Yeah, and that's just not the case and in Columbus. So here's the thing: I know this is probably going to sound bad, and it's probably going to sound kind of racist, but like the vast majority of the restaurants that I've been to in the short north are people that seem like they're my age, and they seem pretty well off. Like I don't really, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I don't know. Maybe it's just I have a weird perception. But I go in there, and most of the time, it's like people. They just, I mean, they don't have any, it doesn't seem like they have any issues. It's not like I'm, you know, it's not like you're going to like an Applebee's and, you know, some desolate suburban wasteland or something. So <laughs> I don't know. It's, I mean, it, like, so I, dude, I, I met this guy. Um, there was a guy who worked at a Condado, like the taco place or whatever. Yeah, sure. And he, he quit his job. He used to work at Chase and he like quit his job. Like, you know, he didn't like his job or whatever, but he quit his job and he's like, yeah, like I don't make as much money, but I still make good money. And like, now I work here. And, like, he likes, you know, he really likes being a bartender or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's, I mean, it's low paying, but it's not that low paying. And then unlike New York and San Francisco and, like, some of these other cities, like, they don't have a, you know, there's no, like, they can actually, like, drive to work. Yeah, they don't if have If they to, want to, like, or take the bus or They whatever. don't have to live in Jersey City and do the yeah. hour 15 commute or, you know, live outside of SF and then take a two-hour yeah. drive plus BART ride to work. Right. I, I still so. don't understand that. But anyways... Yeah, I mean, if you want to be there, I guess I I think it's absolutely bizarre. But well, I mean, that's the that's the thing. Like, if you want to live in a city like that, like that's a luxury, so you're paying for it. So I'd rather move somewhere else, save money for retirement, and you know, try to look for better job opportunities. But hey, what do I know? Okay. So next, you want to talk about smart cities, right? Yeah. So um, smart city is working on this, like uh, pretty much the smart city Columbus operating system. So uh, well, it's called uh, the smart Columbus operating system. And, well, aside from that name being kind of, like, really silly, um, and I, I mean, obviously, it's very, to me, it's very obvious that the people who are working in, like, the smart cities, I don't think that they're, they're certainly not, like, engineers or anything, um, because they wouldn't call it the smart Columbus operating system, uh, but. Is it, wait, is it an actual operating system? No. <laughs> That's just why it doesn't make any sense. Okay. So but, um, the... it's basically, what they're trying to, I like the goal, which is to um, build a public repository of data. So they're they're planning on putting like sensors and whatnot on like bridges and you know all over the place, and then they want um, startups or other companies to build services based off that data. I like that idea. I think that's a cool idea. If you can, you know, you build out the infrastructure, but I do question that they actually know what they're doing. So there's that. You but, shouldn't question it. They don't. We know Smart City doesn't know what they're doing. Like, yeah, that's I true. mean, Smart Columbus has it's shown so far they've done nothing, and it's. I mean, they spent a lot of money. They were they're they're decent. Although, well, they did turn more. They did turn the money they got into more money, which is which is good. I like that. So, um, but yeah. So the the data they say this is what they this is quoting from the. Uh, so this is quoting from the article. Um, this is really the heartbeat of the Smart Columbus project. Deputy innovation officer for the city of Columbus said the person you know, the person who's a deputy innovation officer for the city of Columbus. All of our our projects require data and will give off data. So. <laughs> Um, Smart Columbus is looking to build a web-based information system that will collect and share all of that data. It will include data that allow vehicles, roads, and streetlights to communicate. The data will be open source, available to anyone online to allow entrepreneurs to look at and analyze the information and spark ideas for applications to make transportation more efficient. So what I do like is that, although um, here's some of the data sets, bridge dimensions, highway rest areas. I wish they'd really try because there's so much they could possibly do, but... I do like the idea of like a public API for data like that. I think yeah. that's kind of cool. I mean, but... naming a bunch of static data though is kind of dumb. Like nobody cares. You can look up static data. Right, right, right. Like if it's not it's if it's not moving, then you're not doing anything. Yeah, cool. I mean, frankly, what they need is um, oh, well, they need people who are software engineers to to do this kind of stuff first of all. But what they, I mean, the idea of like taking a whole bunch of data that you know you put sensors all over the place in the city. 
and then you take a whole bunch of data and you put it somewhere and then you let people who actually know how to you know do software engineering and can actually and you know an entrepreneur is actually take that data and then make use of it i love that idea but i just don't trust the the people in charge of it because there's like you know some of the the like one of the data sets are like bridge dimensions there are there are possible uses for bridge like bridge dimension data it's like i can imagine google maps you know if you're or apple maps or whatever if you're like a truck driver there are some bridges you can't go under yeah whatever so that can be useful data added to you know products like that if they don't already have it they probably do but you know it's it's, yeah, like, it's a very limited use case yeah so i would like to see it expanded out but um yeah so far i don't know i'm just i've just kind of been yeah i mean the after after the projects they released it there's there's not yeah we like my hope that. my hopes aren't high for smart columbus they're not uh yeah i was so they're not excited. they're not they're not living up to their name really yeah i was so excited and slowly it's just been it's just been downhill the money might have should maybe should have gone to austin yeah <laughs> the money amazon and the, the crew. crew although you know it's looking like the crew are it looks like pre might be getting uh getting what's coming to them so and it's also looking like uh the the top choice for amazon is starting to look more like it it'll end up i mean at least i i think the going trend now is people are saying it's probably gonna end up in the dc area yeah um i'm starting to think less so austin because uh like austin the city didn't even offer any incentives so well i mean there's also three locations in the dc area i don't buy that i don't think i don't think that i don't think that matters so it's not going to dc but the other two locations i i don't know i i just don't think that that the number of locations matters too much because i mean bezos also just bought like the second most expensive house in dc yeah but that's not his only house he has many houses but and point? like the real headquarters of amazon still in seattle so. yeah i agree um but anyway, okay anyway uh let's move on to uh well <laughs> speaking of actually since this is the next next story so it turns out um there is a uh, uh, gay rights gay rights advocates have identified eight states or eight cities that they're saying the Amazon should avoid. Columbus is one of them because they don't like the state politics. It's kind of fair, but it's not that bad. But um, they've they've said that Amazon should not go to any of these states that have an- that with uh, without any anti-gay discrimi- discrimination laws, which is us. We don't have those on the books. We should. Well, so here's the thing. Um, it's very similar to the Charlotte case where yeah. Col- Columbus has protections um, against, un- or I guess, uh, how would you call it? Not unlawful. Um, like uh, you just can't discriminate. Yeah. I, I mean, just laws against discriminatory firing that includes um, uh, Gen- pe- the sexual orientation. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. LGBT, but, um, et cetera. But yeah. Ohio, Ohio does not have those laws. And so the fear is that, like, worst case, the state could overturn the city. I mean, they could, but I think it would be very unpopular. Yeah. Because, um, like, even most rural people in Ohio don't care that much. Not, Some do, but I don't think it's... Well, not to mention Columbus is, like, the heart of of Ohio and yeah. Ohio and politics. John Kasich lives in, like, Westerville, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> also, Kasich just doesn't strike me as the type of person who's going to pursue that. No, it's, I mean, it's very, I, I was really disappointed with the anti-abortion thing, but I also, I mean, I, I really don't think he's like that bad of a guy. I, I disagree with him on that, but I can at least see the side of it. But he's very much like a moderate Republican. Yeah. Like, like he, I mean, the, I guess the, uh, the fight for gay rights is is so over at this point now that he's like, even if he wanted to pursue it, he just wouldn't bother. Like, he's not, he's a very political creature, I guess, is yeah. what I'm saying. And it's just not in his best interest. Yeah. So uh, I think, I think if that's, if this is an actual fear rather than just like politicking from the, from the gay rights I organization. Think it's just politicking, yeah. But if it's an actual fear, it's ridiculous. And, yeah. but, but I do think you're right that it's probably actually just politicking. Yeah. They said, um, so this group, whatever, um, they said that Indianapolis, Austin, Dallas, Nashville, Atlanta, Columbus, Miami, Raleigh, and the D.C. suburbs were all like, yeah, you can't go there. Oh, yeah, I did say Indianapolis. So um, I don't – this is uh, – this drives me crazy. I don't know why people are like – they like when they write, they say like Columbus, comma, Ohio. But – and then the same thing with Raleigh. Like how do you not know where those places are? But like Indianapolis, like, well, where is that? You know, I don't know. It's just it, – it's one of those things that bugs me, but – well, I mean, I think the thing is there are there are, there is another largest Columbus in Ohio. It's the problem. Yeah, but it's not like who cares about them. I agree. Right. Like so they're in Georgia. Yeah, um, Georgia's pretty lame. But <laughs> um, so let's move on. 
So uh, it turns out that Columbus has become a renter-dominated market, which means that uh, more than half the population of the city lives in a rental unit. So there's a there's like a uh, a group called uh, it's like Americans like the American Dream Group or something. So people still have that antiquated antiqui- antiquated is that how you say that antiquated, antiquated? there yeah. there we go um, idea that being a homeowner is like the American Dream when it's not because a home is a huge cost um, it's not an investment. So stop thinking that. Oh, God. Anyway, so Columbus is now a renter-dominated market, which I think is probably a good thing, mostly because buying a house is really expensive. Um, I don't want to see... I'd rather people save for retirement instead of waste their money on a house. So that was the other... That was the last story I had for uh, Columbus News. Yeah, I mean, real quick on that. I just, like, I'm... I don't know why people are surprised or even opposed to this. Like, the housing market is, is crazy in Columbus right now. Why would people not be renting? Yeah. I mean, if you want to buy a house in Upper Arlington or Bexley or Grandview or something, it's easily half a million dollars. Yeah. Like one and, of the, I mean, and previously it was like less than half of that. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, the market I mean, yeah. is insane and especially in places like Bexley, Westerville, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so right now, as of today, Columbus is the 95th most expensive rental market in the U S with a median one bedroom rent price of six ninety three. but that's, um, and then in uh, San Francisco, it's 30, 3,300, New York's 2,800, and then uh, DC's 2,500. So, yeah. yeah, basically the same if you think about it. Yeah, basically the same. All right. Well, should we move on to debate and discussion? Let's do it. Okay, so first up in debate and discussion, we have a story about Mozilla and okay. uh, and Firefox again because we haven't talked about them in like three weeks, so we're <laughs> we're obligated at this yeah, point. Yeah, we gotta get back to them. All right, so um, in their new browser, they've in, or sorry, I guess in the new version of Firefox, so Firefox fifty nine, they've implemented a feature that will um, essentially strip all the query params data and a lot of the header information from um, from transitions. Now, so for all the all the non-tech people, what this essentially means is that like there's a bunch of embedded data when you go from one website to another, poten- yeah. potentially, not necessarily, but potentially. Um, and so, if you're in private browsing mode, they're they're going to remove that. Okay. So this is this is important, or I guess relevant. I don't know how you put it. Um, because so if if they decide to do this for like their browser in general, yeah, it's going to change the way a lot of websites work because it kills Amazon affiliate. Link. So cur- keep in mind, currently this is only for private browsing. Yeah, but if they decide to implement this like wide scale, yeah, there will be no more Amazon affiliate links. Um, Google will it'll be a lot harder for Google to track where you're at on the internet coming from other places because Google basically knows where you're at at all times because they have AdSense in, yeah. on like every other website, right. And think about it. If you have ads, let's say you have AdSense on like 20% of websites. Yeah, which is probably more than that. So if they do, any traffic in or out of those 20% of websites they see. So they have a they have a decently clear picture of where you are at, even if you're using Adblock to some extent on, yeah. on the internet. How does that make you feel, by the way? Just... Well, it's really annoying, obviously. So, um... But... Um, <laughs> This would this would kind of change how that works because a lot of the uh, a lot of the header data and the transition data is being purged. But yeah. right now it's it's limited only to their private browsing, so the effect isn't as isn't as I mean it's it's not yeah. a huge thing now. Well, I hope they do it. Well, you so. you hope they um, start stripping the data away in the yeah. normal browser. Although I'm not like I'm not opposed to Amazon affiliate links. Like I don't see the the big deal of that. But um, well, I mean. If they want to do affiliate links, they need to do them in a different way, I yeah. guess. So, but those those aren't too big of a deal. But I definitely don't like Google following people around. So, it's I mean, like, it, there's like a creepy stalker. <laughs> well, it it also um, would do away with like websites knowing where their traffic is coming from. Yeah. So, like, if you're like, I don't know, the New York Times, and you want to know where all this traffic on this like story that normally wouldn't get very much headway is coming yeah. from, so like that would be gone. I wouldn't mind so much if they if um like people. Like if there's a way that they could kind of do aggregate, like you like you had five visitors from Japan. I don't like I don't have a problem with the website knowing that. So then I think they'll they'll still have that data. Um, what I'm what, what this specifically concerns is this concerns query params, um, um, like your get and post strings that follow yeah. an actual link, and right. so so the demographic data is kind of still there. It's just where like where is this traffic sourced from? Yeah, that goes away. Where yeah. being like 
what URL, not what country. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, I think that's that's pretty interesting. So we'll uh, we'll probably be we'll probably have more comments on that in a few months if uh, if they do anything further with it. Yeah. So going and, and that coincides with uh, I mean not quite the same thing, but with the like, Google's put, I guess putting in ad block into their. I mean, we talked about this before, but they're putting in ad block into Chrome and stuff. So does that uh, does that block Google AdWords, Google AdSense? No way. <laughs> it's supposed to block, uh, but it's supposed to block like uh, abusive ads and ads that don't conform to Google's like ad standards. Oh, which I see. will probably which for them. I mean, the the reason they're doing that is because they're trying to nip you know nip this in the bud because there's a huge revolt against ads. I mean, everybody knows that ads are just garbage. It's, it's also smashing can. competition. Yeah. Right, like it, so. This is the this is the thing about yeah. legislation too. Like, if you get to define the legislation, you can define the legislation to meet what you're already doing, and right. your competition isn't. Right. So, so, I mean, it's still a monopoly. It's, it's anti, yeah, it's still anti-competitive. And yeah, I still think it's a overall. It's a bad. Well, I don't know. I, I say just don't use Chrome. Like, you can use the development tools because they're still the best. But just don't just use Firefox and. Or, yeah, I'm, in, uh, I'm inclined to so, agree. Or if you have a Mac, use Safari is fine. Like I don't, like, people complain about like, oh, you're using Safari. I don't know why it's got this bad rap. I use it all the time. There's, I don't have any issues or anything. So I mean, it, it's it's got the reputation because it's just like an, it's an okay browser. Yeah, like like, like, like people I, want something new and different. It's like oh, well, or or they know. want something great like Firefox. I mean, Firefox is good, but I like the I like the in, integration with uh, with Safari. So, but whatever, it's not a big deal. But all right. Um, so, and kind of it, another interesting news. So we talk about healthcare, universal healthcare. Um, I think all of, all of our listeners at this point know that I'm largely in favor of uh, universal healthcare. Although I am cer- certainly op- op- know of and am open to discussions otherwise, because I I know what they are. I just think something's better. But uh, recently, three huge heavyweight companies, uh, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, are uh, Announced that they are coming together to uh, basically create a, uh, a healthcare company, I think, between the three of them, so that they uh, aren't contracting out their because, like, right now they you know they'll contract out to like Cigna or United Healthcare or whoever um, for like uh, for health insurance, but it looks like uh, you know they announced and they decided like, hey, you know that's just not working for us, so they're supposed to be coming together to create their own healthcare company. Yeah. So. I mean, that it was... sounds sounds pretty interesting. Um, it's so the the players in this are kind of weird to me. So, yeah. or at least one of the players. So, yeah. Amazon, I think, makes sense. They have half a million employees. That's a yeah. lot of healthcare to worry uh, JP about. JP Morgan has like two or three hundred thousand. J- JP Morgan has like a quarter million. This is yeah. coming from Hacker News. But Berk- Berkshire Hathaway has like twelve thousand. Right, they're just huge in terms of assets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Well, like, so actually, I think if if you if you count. So maybe they themselves don't, but the companies they own, like Ge- they own like Geico, for example. Do wait? Do they pay? Do they? Are are those people getting included in, included in this? I insurance don't see thing? why they wouldn't, because okay. Berkshire Hathaway owns those companies. It's if it's a cost saving measure, then they're gonna want to save those costs with their other. Um, oh okay. I mean that's what I would think. Now they haven't really specific details about that, but uh, Berkshire owns quite a few companies. Like again, like I think Geico is one of the, the larger ones and there's, uh, there's a ton of, I don't know of all, but there's a ton of them. So I don't know why this hasn't been tried before. Um, because well, maybe it has, you, know. you and I have argued nonstop that like the worst possible solution yeah. to healthcare is the one where you have this giant middleman that's consuming all the money. Yeah. Right, right. Which is basically what we have. So, so I don't, I don't know why no one has tried setting up a not for profit, um, like their company based, well, especially um, these big companies like Amazon. Well, the the thing is, like hospitals are doing it for sure. So like Ohio Health and uh, well, even and, and, like well Wexner. I mean, for example, like they're starting to offer their own insurance through their own um, health because then they get to instead of contracting out, like they're keeping the profits, they're providing the service, they have control yeah. over the entire domain. Yeah, I was gonna say OSU's healthcare system is actually really good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wonder why it's not a more common thing in the corporate world. Yeah, I don't I mean, know, but it's 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 certainly an interesting free market solution for that. So, I, I will say this is, I mean, this is a very good thing, especially in the event that you don't end up seeing um, single payer healthcare. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, I, I'd like to I like to see what they you know see what they do and see uh, see what ends up coming out of that. So, um, so switching gears here, the the Trump administration, and this is, I think, is pretty fascinating. Uh, I don't know if you'll think it is as well, but. Um, the Trump. So there, uh, there's a leak. There's some leaked documents. There's all these leaks from the Trump administration. Uh, I don't know 
why that's like a thing. But uh, there are some leaked documents that uh, the Trump administration is proposing to build a to build and or take over the uh, 5G telecommunications network that is supposed to be built. So right now we're on 4G LTE or whatever. Yeah. Now they're so the cynical view is that they want uh, the NSA to have complete control over it or at least complete access, which is uh, probably 100 percent true. And then the other, actually, I don't know what, what's. And then the other thing is they're worried about. Um, they're driven by. So the article says that they're driven by security security concerns related to China's development of five G networks and and what have you. And then uh, if China builds five G networks, then U S providers might buy equipment from China, I guess, to set these up or or something like that. So well, yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, we've we've seen what putting infrastructure in the hands of of private companies has has led to as far as the internet goes and it's yeah. and it's kind of i mean on, honestly it's shitty right yeah like that is that is the bigger concern the net neutrality um in reality right because they're they're able to be non-competitive in locales right. and, that, and that's how they operate so the government sort of taking taking hold of this thing isn't the worst thing especially from a like well and i mean if you also think about it um they i mean the fcc owns the wireless spectrum right now yeah. They, they, they've been selling it. I, I think they should only be licensing it, but they've been selling it to like AT&T and Verizon and who have you. So, I mean, it's, it's certainly nothing that's unprecedented. And I, I mean, aside from like the NSA getting in, you know, getting the greedy little tentacles in there, I'm not opposed to it because, you know, something like the airwaves or, well, the air we breathe or what have you, um, to me, that's a common good. And if we're going to have a government, one of the functions of government is to regulate and control things that are public goods, like rivers and you know the ocean, you know what have you. Those are all things yeah. that are public goods. So, I, I mean, it's, it seems like a normal government thing to do. So I'm not really opposed to it at all. And this is this is well defined legally too, in case you're wondering. So, yeah. um, just a just a bit of background. This is this has been decided pretty, I guess, pretty decisively in in several cases that. Um, Anything that travels over the airways, right, over invisible, you know, waves that yeah. travel through public spaces, that that is that is a public good and is completely subject to the regulation of, uh, I guess, I guess like what's in the best interest of the common good. Yeah. Um, and that's that's part of why you would see you see things like um, much heavier censorship on set, like when TV was satellite based versus when it became cable based. Yeah. Because there's there's no there's no requirement for you to um, uphold like non obscenity yeah. when when you're providing something via cable, right? That's being paid for. Um, you're paying for that line to be run to your house, yeah. and they own the and they own the. I mean, they own the you know the posts and the wires. Whether or not they should, that's a completely different discussion. But that's yeah. that's how it's ruled. So here's a. This is this is kind of interesting here. So um, Ajit Pai, Chairman Pai, the one of the worst humans alive. Warned that, and this is a, a quote, that any federal effort to construct a nationalized 5G network would be a costly and counterproductive distraction, uh, end quote, from winning, quote, the 5G war. Um, so obviously he's against it because if the government's owning the infrastructure as they should, then that reduces the profits of his, uh, you know, the, his masters, the people that own him and uh, tell him what to do. So, you know, he's pretty against it, which I think is funny because it's an interesting... Like why I, I just don't understand Trump's sometimes Trump Trump's very like he's like schizophrenic, like some days he's doing something amazing like this like I think this is a good idea and then on the other other days he's like letting you know Chairman Pi get away with trying to screw net neutrality. Well, here's here's the so. thing, um, like you you keep expecting him to be like a consistent. I think you expect him to be like a consistent Republican. And well, I, no, I just I no, I, it's just like but I don't. I, don't, I know he's not re, like a traditional Republican. I just I don't. I wouldn't. His, I, but the things that he's doing, like this, so like constructing a five G network or something, is not like I just don't see how that fits into any. He's just he just he's just all over the place, and it's just well. Weird. I think so. I mean, I, and, and I've said this forever that he's like a populist who wants to be well liked. Yeah, and well, so then why didn't he support net neutrality? Well, because net neutrality could be spun to be like the government manipulating people. Like that was the argument. It, it's yeah. So as long as there's like an argument, whether it makes you know sense from a technical perspective or not, they they like can convince people. Like he'll he'll hop on board. He's not he's not that hard to convince. Yeah. Well, you know what they say: stand for nothing and you fall for anything. Boom. <laughs> Quotes. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm not I'm not like defending <laughs> the president. Yeah, I know. Um, um, but 
So so I I'm, I'm not surprised by this. Generally, I think he leans he and his administration lean very heavily populist, even when they're supporting very very Unpopular I guess things. well no very very like traditionally democratic policies. Yeah. All right then, Eric. Let's move on to the feature. Let's do it. So Trevor, you're are you familiar with uh, WeChat, W E and then chat? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So WeChat is homegrown as a homegrown Chinese messaging app um, that's extremely popular in uh in, in China, like beyond crazy popular. What what do you um, mean by popular? Like thirty eight billion messages a day, kind of So it's kind of it's just like a chat application? So um so nope, nope. It's a uh, so it's a chat application and, and on top of that they build in like you can play games, um payments talk to your you know chat obviously uh so it's got it's more like a platform that other people are doing doing stuff with on top of that so uh one of the things that china is doing is that what they're what they're working on is building a national id system into uh like into this app so if you go to like the government and you need to have like something done you'd like have this little like you would pull up wechat with like your government id in it now I'm I'm a big fan of like I so like on and like on iPhone you know how you have like the wallet app or whatever yeah sure which I assume is like similar to whatever Google has but um, I I actually wrote to one of our um, like our sen- like state senator or, or somebody like that we should do this like we should just instead of like issuing out state IDs like, it should be an option to have like a you know like a virtual ID like you can just show it to people and whatever I feel like it'd be m- more more secure you can't like re- you you can't like you can't really lose it you can't replace like you can easily re- like you could pay and then not have to do anything. Like, yeah, phys- f- physical IDs are are complete nonsense in my opinion. Yeah, because here's the thing: if so, like let's say you get pulled over by a cop and you don't have an ID. Yeah, but l- you have an ID, but you don't have it with you. Right. Do you know what happens to you? Uh, something bad. And it's like a twenty four dollar cost for like failure to produce ID. Why does that exist? Yeah, I mean it's yeah, and so it's really stupid. Republicans should be all over this too, like. They shouldn't be in favor of like people get, getting fined for not having an ID. By the by, the way, Republicans, if you're listening to that. So, um, but anyway, so I I think that's actually kind of cool. But I would prefer that the state ID it be a state ID run by the you know the state government. It should be optional, of course. But so China is looking to do that, and then for a, a, a premium fee, you can get a color ID. So the one you get is like in black and white, and then um, that'll let you, I guess. You'll be able to use that to produce ID, like an identification. Like if you want to go to and like get a, open up a new cell phone bill account thing or something, so you could do that. But if you want to use it for like more official things, you have to get like this color one, and it, it's a premium thing, which I, I think that's really stupid. But um, so WeChat's extremely popular in China, and that shouldn't surprise you because not only is Facebook Messenger and Facebook blocked. WhatsApp is blocked, and then uh, there's a Korean company who owns this, uh, or it's Korean owned. It's a there's an app called Line, L I N E. Never, sure. I never, I had never, yeah, heard, I've of never heard of it either. Um, and apparently, that's blocked too. So, and Facebook Messenger has been blocked since 2009. So, wh- why were they blocked? Uh, just government can't control it. I think the Chinese government can't can't control it, and then they're American businesses or foreign businesses, and so trying to, you know, if if a Chinese company doesn't own 51 percent of the the venture then you can't like do business in in china yeah so. china is very aggressive about um, yeah so but, here's what i think trevor exp- I, th- I think companies uh countries across so if you're japan south korea um all of the uh like the west as you would call it uh, i think every single one of those countries should block uh should block wechat completely like you're not allowed to have it should be kicked out of the app store etc because well, i think it's complete bs that a, you know a country is just like well, we're gonna block all the competitors and just like let our just let whatever our thing is like succeed and like grow and then, you know, screw you guys. That's stupid. That's so it's anti-competitive and it it drives me crazy that 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 happens. Well, this puts them in a very American position because um, Europe considered doing something like this to America like um, after World War Two. So yeah. well, certain countries. So the idea is, um, and then and that's you know Eastern Europe notwithstanding. Um, so the problem with this is if we stop doing business with China in this way yeah. and the UK stops doing business and Germany stops doing business, but right. France doesn't, France stands to gain a whole lot. 
I mean, kind of. And so what you're looking at, I mean, you're you're always going to have this market problem, which which is sort of an approximation of the the tragedy of the commons, right? Yeah. If if you aren't taking the resource that everyone else is taking, you're the only one losing out because they like you keep, getting people to cooperate on um, not being exploited by China is is kind of a is is a hard thing to do. Yeah. And the United States kind of rose to to you know being you know the country by doing this the very same thing. So it's it's like it's, it's but, like standard playbook for people who yeah. have the ability to do that. I think it's a little bit different though because uh, first, I mean, Europeans started World War II, and then well, I wasn't uh, talking <laughs> about World War II. I'm, well, I'm right, right, right. But after World War II, um, you know, the so I mean, there's a technology thing, I guess, too. But so like after World War II, the, you know, the Marshall Act or whatever it was, I think it was the Marshall Act. You know, they so they basically rebuilt Europe and you know did all this stuff and people had the same sort of resentment towards the United States then to some extent not completely because obviously the United States helped out tremendously but you know with, with, with the, I think technology is a little bit different but I think the there's some parallels in the the two cases here and it I think the parallels here are you know who is doing what and why are they doing it in the case of China they're doing it not because Europe needs help with technology or they, you know, they, they have a shortage of, you know, chat applications. And so they need chat applications to do business. Unlike, you know, the Marshall Act or whatever, when, okay, so we need bricks, we need steel, we need cars or wh- whatever. Like we need all this stuff to rebuild a country. So yeah, I, th- I think that the U S was kind of, you know, at least back, back towards technology, there's a, the fear of like, Oh well, you know all these U.S. industries are going to you know dominate us, but the U.S. also isn't blocking European companies from operate doing business in the United States. Whereas, you know, in, with the case of China, they're effectively blocking other countries from coming in and doing business. Which, but at the same time, expecting that those countries accept that China can get to come and do business there. So I think the U.S. and the EU got together and said, anytime you ban a company like one of our companies from doing, you know, anytime you're, if you're going to have this policy, then the U S and EU can just buy, they should just take their business elsewhere. <clears throat> yeah, maybe. So, I mean, I, do, I, regardless though, I do think, um, the U S wasn't completely altruistic after world war two either. Oh no, like, of course not. I mean, not like, completely, but I, I think in both cases, what you're looking at is what I would call market imperialism. Yeah. Um, where you're providing a resource and sort of making, or you're, you're attempting to provide a resource with the long term goal of making people somewhat dependent on it to, right. in, I guess, in strengthen your own position. China yeah. is doing that currently. The US definitely did it after yeah. World War II. Um, and sure, you know, what you're providing may or may not be of use. I don't think WeChat is that useful. But, um, yeah, like that's that's, and not I mean, to mention the the Chinese government's using it compl- like they are logging one hundred percent of the activity going on too. So yeah, I mean, I, I even if Facebook's doing it, Facebook's not really beholden to the U.S. government as much as like WeChat's like integrated with the Chinese government. So I mean, I I doubt there's like a functional huge amount of difference that that like will make a difference in your everyday life when it comes right down to it. No, probably, and not, not to mention the Chinese government has their tendrils all over the place anyway so you're you'd like the ship has right. sailed if you're in china right yeah. truth, truth be told um but well, yeah i mean yeah. i get i guess the 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 big difference between the two really is um inshore um establishing a establishing a competitive advantage which yeah. is what china's doing the u.s really didn't yeah um it didn't really matter for the u.s because the u.s was dominating those industries anyways and china's sort of digging a foothold so that they can do that yeah and that's kind of the difference but um i mean this what i'm saying is this isn't exactly unprecedented and you're going you're not going to see what you want to have happen happen because the market just won't allow it yeah which is disappointing because you know you shouldn't let let bad actors um do bad actor things but here we are so well yeah i don't i don't even know what to say yeah, it's just an, it's just really annoying. I mean, I'm probably gonna keep bringing up stories like this until China is, you know, punished for being or jerks. China is bigger than us, and we all are bowing to our Chinese overlords. No, that'll never happen. The 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 I, I don't like I don't really get the fear mongering. Um, so one of my uh, uh, a listener today actually sent me this uh, this this image. I can't I can't show you or whatever, but so in 2011, um, just to, just because we're on this, and he sent this earlier, um, there was the, the in 2011 the Financial Times Global 500 list. They like have a list or whatever. So um, <clears throat> they have like they have it broken down by like four quarters. But I'll just give you like one quarter, um, just the fourth quarter, I guess. So 
the uh, top 10 companies by um, like by revenue. So number one was Exxon Mobil at like 406 billion, then Apple, then PetroChina, then Royal Dutch Shell, um, ICBC, which is the international bank, yeah, ch- Chinese bank, yeah, um, Microsoft, IBM, Chevron, Walmart, China Mobile, and then if you look um, like there's a like a smattering of other like companies in here. So like in third quarter, it was China Mobile was in the top ten, and Nestle, and then. Um, Petrobras out of uh, Brazil and what have you. And then he sent me um, 2017, which is the updated one. And the fourth quarter, get this. Um, so it's Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. I was going to say it's five. I was going to say it's all the tech companies. And then six was Tencent. Uh, Berkshire, Berkshire Berkshire Hathaway was seven. Then eight was Alibaba, Johnson and Johnson. Then uh, it looks like J.P. Morgan Chase was there. But it was kind of interesting to see. In 2011, it was a lot like the top companies. It was a lot more international, if you will. Still, mostly dominated by the U.S. But by 2017, it's almost completely dominated by the U.S. and China. Well, in, actually, in, in 2017, there's not a single non-American or Chinese company. Keep in mind, though, our tech companies are consolidating rapidly, and also China's on our heels as far as like that top ten list. Because right now, you have you have Huawei gaining an insane amount of ground very yeah. very quickly, like 500 percent profit why oh why what the hell yeah that's crazy um but and of course and of course they're backed by the chinese government providing them a near i mean a near duopoly on the market them plus is out me yeah so i like i don't really so on one hand i don't really have a problem with like other countries um so like let's say you're china like if you're trying to start like spin up a homegrown business like okay so there's all these tech american and probably european but mostly american tech companies we want to grow our own you know tech companies so let's give them some sort of benefit or something like that i don't have a problem with that but what i have a problem with is when it's like oh well we're gonna own all the companies or like you can't like you can't even come here and do business and i just think that that's wrong is that's my uh because it's it's just so anti-competitive like there's no reason like if, if a chinese company um and you can apply this to any country too i'm, I'm just picking on china because they the, they do it most notably but um you know if you want to provide some sort of benefits so that like your home country companies can effectively compete with uh, international market, like in the international market, don't have a problem with that. But when you're shutting off competition um, and then you're expecting that other countries aren't going to shut you off, like that's what I have a problem with. And I have a problem with that uh, we are, we're not doing that. So, so you just, you just want to play tit for tat with China, but, yeah. um, but unfortunately it's just not going to happen. Well, it's not going to happen because people are stupid. Uh. Like the government's stupid. It's, that's I mean that's the only reason. There's otherwise there's absolutely no reason not to do it. It's it's I mean incentives drive everything. Yeah, I, I mean if you're looking at things from a short term, like you know your company will be out of business pr- perspective, I guess. But or like a long term, um, you know, other people are going to capture market space that we're now throwing away, kind of thing. I mean that's yeah. the problem. But um, I think we've I think we've sort of talked that to death. So yeah. Ready to call it a day? I'm ready. Oh. Well, this has uh, been Columbus this week. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Bye.